Welcome to Business Spotlight, where we share insights, pills of wisdom, and top tips from local business owners. My name is Kerry James. I'm a business coach and facilitator. And this afternoon, uh, we welcome MD of Essential Content, Sean O'Mara. Good afternoon to you, Sean. Good afternoon, Kerry. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Let's start, if we may, please, Sean, with an overview of Essential Content, a little bit of the history, and what do you specialize in, please? We are a communications agency. We deliver a range of services. The two main ones are public relations and user experience content production. Uh, that second one probably needs a little bit of an explanation, which I can hopefully do quite quickly. So most people will know what content production is. User experience content production is specifically about task completion well, the work we do anyway. So that can be anything from resetting a password to applying for a mortgage and everything in between. Um, it's a little bit more of a science than an art. There's a lot of testing um, and analytics involved. And we deliver that mainly to businesses in regulated sectors. That's our niche in the content production side. Uh, public relations we don't um, we don't specialize by industry we specialize by business type okay tell us a little bit more then the regulated industries and business type what what might be ideal clients for you please Sean uh, big banks tend to be good uh, the reason we specialize with um, regulated businesses and more specifically FCA regulated businesses so the financial conduct authority is because myself and my colleagues spotted a opportunity and a challenge a few years ago so what you might find is let's say you're a bank and you want to deliver a better experience for existing customers and prospects and you decide let's revamp our current account application process. So you hire a cool agency. Um, they do really, really cool works, very innovative, very forward thinking. That work then gets to your bank compliance team and it gets stopped because while the work is good and interesting, it breaches one or more of the FCA regulations, which are complex, nuanced, and very important. So... I have a background working with FCA regulated businesses. So do a number of my colleagues. And what we kept hearing about from clients was we hired this agency. They were great, but we can't use their work. Can you help us fix it? So instead of fixing things that are broken, we're trying to speak to those businesses now and say, we're not cool necessarily. Um, we're small. We are not a prestige agency, but what we do know is what your regulator is thinking and we know how to deliver effective communications that serve the user well whilst not giving you compliance headaches because those compliance headaches are very expensive to fix okay so and, and what about on the pr side then sean do you work with similar types of clients or is it a we, yeah we do the risks um are a little bit different depending on whether you're communicating via the media or directly to your own users. So we we do a lot of work. So the, the kind of um, client we've done really good work for historically would be an established business that is underperforming online and they're being overtaken by newer businesses in their sector that are just more uh, savvy about their online presence. So we, we help make established businesses a little bit more internet famous. Um, there's lots of ways of doing that. The way we do it, our philosophy when we're doing public relations is talk about what you know before you talk about what you do. So don't go out to the media saying, oh, hey, we've got this great new service or product or we've just hired a new CFO. Give them insights. Give them something from behind the scenes that you've got. Every business is interesting, but not every business knows that it's interesting. So we try and surface those little nuggets and uh, um, bits of insight that can form the basis of a media campaign. 
Okay. Well, you mentioned media then, Sean. Clearly, we've been in a very turbulent few years with lockdown and inflation and interest rates and all the rest of it. And thinking about the digital revolution, of course, and a whole plethora of new ways of communicating chat GPT, of course, coming to the forefront in the the last, you know, six, eight weeks or so. How have those changes impacted on your business, would you say? So lockdown was interesting um, because every single one of our clients reacted to it in a different way, but they all were anxious. And what we learned during lockdown was contracts aren't really worth anything because when something unprecedented like that happens and you have the choice of holding your clients to their contracts, even though they're going through hell or trying to work with them so that they're still there when when the panic is over, obviously, if you're smart, you're going to choose option B. So we had a lot of clients come in and say, basically, we're panicking. We want to scale back on what we're spending can we technically breach our contract spend less pause so we had to work a solution for every client and then that was horrible that week where i got uh between 10 and 15 phone calls or emails from worried business owners and budget holders uh, i had to think what do i do i decided very quickly i'm not gonna uh be a stickler we're gonna try and work with our clients and you know we we were worried as well so the last thing we wanted to do was start falling out with clients over terms and conditions so we we tried to become a lot more flexible and we tried to identify ways to deliver value on smaller budgets so a little bit of fat trimming around what we did and some of those things we did we've kept because actually they they represented better value for the client give you an example we used to invest quite a bit of time in our reporting so at the end of the week and the end of the month we'd produce quite glossy pretty coverage reports they take a little bit of time to pull together and i had a client when we were just starting out who uh was in the the logistics sector and he's former military and he's very very straight up and down really really nice man but um not one for waffle and he told me years ago um i'm happy with a spreadsheet you you send me a spreadsheet with all the coverage you've got for my business i don't need the graphics i don't need anything else and i don't really like the idea of you investing much of my budget in producing these things so i said yeah all right um and then i thought i'm going to do for all the other clients what i do for him um we we explain this to the client say we do spend a bit of time making your reports look pretty obviously that comes out of the overall budget how would you feel about just getting a spreadsheet with no branding no nothing and they're all like yeah fine let's you know let's stick to the basics so we've kept a few of our lockdown mitigations as just normal business as usual um another thing and this is specific to public relations but lockdown in a way was a little bit of a not going to say gift because it was horrible for lots of reasons but one thing that did happen was the broadcast media suddenly realized that they didn't need to exclusively pull their contributors from london in the past you would have to if you wanted to get a client on tv less so on radio but certainly on sky or bbc you would either have to get them to a studio in London or if you were lucky and it was to do with sport or five live, obviously that's in Manchester. Um, When they stopped bringing people into the studio, they upped their um, infrastructure to get people doing what they're doing now, communicating over video. And that meant that theoretically they could have contributors from anywhere in the world. We kind of took advantage of that because if somebody's doing um, their contribution over video, it's less of a time burden on them. They don't need to travel. Um, it's easier for the broadcaster to set up. They can have somebody on standby if something goes wrong. Um, so broadcasters sort of, they challenge their own thinking. And I think 
it's been good for the media to seek opinion and expertise from outside that M25 bubble. It wasn't always exclusively London, but there was a heavy bias towards London and the Southeast. And if you were not from the UK and you were visiting and you turned on the news, you would think all the smart people in the UK live in London, Cambridge and Oxford. And obviously, I know that's not true. I've got clients all over the world, lots of clients in the north of England, some in uh, Europe, some in America. And it kind of, it did away with that invisible barrier to access. So that's one thing that kind of boosted us a little bit. We were able to get more broadcast coverage for our clients. Okay. And what you mentioned a few, what we might call relatively traditional media, such as radio and, and TV, etc. There's been quite a few changes in the communication landscape, of course, with, with podcasts uh, mm-hmm. becoming so much more popular. It, has there been quite a change in the, the sort of media channels that you're using now? There has. Um, we we do go after podcasts because it's a, it's a good opportunity for clients to dig a little bit deeper into their messaging. And obviously they get more time and it's a little bit less intense than TV. Um, what we do find is, is that a lot of clients still like the Daily Mail, the Guardian, and the Times. They like what we call those prestige brand, those prestige media brands. Because take take out all of the PR terminology, share of voice, things like that. Everybody likes being able to send a link to their mom or their wife or husband say look i'm in the times so we always try and talk to the clients we support on on a sort of what does pr do for your business kind of level doesn't matter how much data you show a client they it's hard not to be delighted when you get something in the times so that's that's a real thing that is um it's emotional rather than data driven but it still counts as a win so we still work closely with um the big nationals we still prioritize those because they do a lot for brand trust they do a lot for reach um if you get something in the times it's likely to appear elsewhere so um we are probably you would probably describe us as a traditional digital PR agency, which is sort of an oxymoron. But if you were to take old school PR and then digital PR and then what is coming now, we sit between traditional digital and what's coming now, which is podcast and all sorts of other jazz. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about the in kind of environmental factors and changes and the impact on your business. But apart from those, what would be the key challenges you've got today in your business in terms of surviving and thriving and, and growing as a business? I think the the challenges we face um, are quite, quite distinct to our industry. So with um, the user experience work that we do, it's quite easy to demonstrate value. You take what the client had, and then you show them what you've done to improve it. With public relations, there's an attribution gap and it affects every public relations firm in the world because if my public relations firm gets your company spokesperson on TV, there's no way of accurately measuring what impact that has on your business. You will see an increase in website traffic. You'll see an increase in inquiries. But it's, it's not like paid advertising where you can literally point to this user clicked this link and came to your website and performed this action. So the challenge our industry has is accepting that there's an attribution gap and stepping away from um, grasping at trying to demonstrate attribution and, and help businesses understand the overall going to sound like a bit of a pretentious idiot but the holistic picture um it compounds over time so you start day zero you sign your contract with your agency in 12 months time if they're good 
lots of things will change um, that you will have noticed within your business. But it's hard to pinpoint what piece of work had an impact. Obviously, you do a big campaign, you get a front page or you get somebody on TV. The next day's increased interest is kind of, it's obvious, but correlation doesn't equal causation when it comes to PR. Mm -hmm. There are things that we've done years ago that suddenly come back around and you know we've had clients who we'd stopped we hadn't worked with for three years say uh we're getting a lot of inquiries off something that has just gone live um was it you and i'll go and look at it and i'll say well yeah it was us but it's something we did three years ago that's just been picked up now so that's great but it's also frustrating because um it would have been really nice if it had happened three years ago when they were retained. So lots of challenges, but I think attribution is still still the big one for the industry and for us as an agency. And before we press the record button on this interview, Sean, you, you mentioned you growing quite quite rapidly over the last couple of years. What sort of challenges has that created for you? Um, the the I guess the obvious challenge to me is. Um, I guess to use a football analogy, deciding which positions we need to strengthen um, and deciding whether we need impact immediately or talent for the future. The talent pipeline and putting a squad together today to go out and win. Those, those are the challenges I'm facing. I am out of my comfort zone at this stage of growth. We've gone from kind of hustling and getting things done by the seat of our pants we're um we've sort of the way i, I liken it to we, we're just coming out of our teens we've gone through adolescence that was rocky it was uncomfortable we are now a mature communications agency what does that look like in terms of people and i i've you know I've had jobs where I've helped recruit, but I don't know about recruitment. So I'm having to do it the best I can and make decisions that I think will help the business not only grow, but deliver better services to the clients that we've had for years. And if we took that step forward and got into a, a, an even more or even less predictable area, Sean, what aspirations do you have for essential content and where do you, Kind of see yourself in maybe four or five years time the honest answer to that question is i have no idea um people i trust keep telling me that i need to know um one thing that i probably should pay more attention to is the f the the future to me is next quarter and i know that's not necessarily the best way to look at it but this business started off with me freelancing and then being asked by a client to incorporate so that they could sue me if anything went wrong. That's why it's a limited company. I was happy freelancing and I had to make a decision a few years ago about is essential content me plus a network of freelancers or is it a proper business? And once I made that decision, I'm having to think about Lots of things that I didn't think about when I was just, okay, I'm freelancing and a bit extra. So the honest answer is I don't know, but I think it will probably involve um, a degree of specialization that we, that we don't have yet. I think it might be a reductive process. We might actually look at taking things out of our offer and becoming really good at one or two things. Okay, well... Well done. I'm not getting sued so far, Sean. <laughs> um, what are the lessons though? You mentioned, um, you know, the learning that you've gone through. What would you say are the key lessons as you've moved from being a freelancer to being a, a, a business owner? So my older brother is um, a business owner and he's been doing it for longer than I have. He's doing it bigger and better and he said to me quite a while back, um, think of your business as a bakery 
and decide whether you want to bake cakes or run a bakery because you can't do both. And it's probably the simplest way of describing the lesson I've learned. I like uh, I like writing press releases. I like dealing with journalists. You don't do that if you're trying to run a comms agency. You do have to sort of get on the shop floor. Otherwise, you don't understand the work that's being delivered in your name. So I do like to be involved and I do like to train people. But I'm having to accept that I'm no longer a publicist or a writer. I'm I'm running an agency. And that skill set is very, very different to the skill set that I was confident and proud of. I'm now I'm now doing something where I know it's not necessarily my strong suit. But if I want the business to grow, it it needs to be uh something that I'm comfortable with. I wonder if your brother or yourself has read uh the E Myth, one of the best selling books about setting up small businesses. And the reason I, I mentioned that is that it's it's based on a story about a bakery. I he's probably read it. Yeah, he's probably nicked it. Yeah. I'll ask him later if he nicked it. But it stuck with me because I felt like I was cheating myself if I wasn't doing the um the sort of day-to-day core stuff and what i have learned is there are people within my business that absolutely knock my work in in, what's the phrase knock it into a cocked hat basically i'm not the best publicist in my public relations agency and i'm not the best copywriter there are people that kind of make make me look mediocre which is good because i think i'm all right mm. well so, key, key principle of becoming a great business owner of course is hire people that's uh that are better at yourself at doing specific things yeah. yeah yeah and i need to figure out what other things i need people to come and do better than i'm doing it currently very good well it's been fascinating thanks so much for your time and input one last question if i may please sean if if anybody is interested in the conversation with you about probably most likely PR, I, I guess. What, what might be a, a kind of useful next step in that process? Um, email me uh, or ring me. I'm my you know, the, Our phone number is on our website. I'm quite happy to just answer the phone. Um, send me an email. Describe your business in a paragraph. Tell me if you had a magic wand and you could have any media coverage tomorrow, where would it be? That's a good way to start the conversation. Um, but the the website is essentialcontent.co.uk and you can get in touch either via the contact form or there's an email address on there, there's a phone number on there. We don't have any sort of AI chatbots trying to answer your inquiry. It will be probably me. We're not that big. Um, so get in touch that way. We'll have a chat and we'll take it from there. Excellent. All right, then, Sean. Well, thanks ever so much for your time and your input and all the very best with essential content. Thank you. And thanks for having me.